Welcome back to another video for A Legal Studies Teacher Reads the News. I'm going to jump around a fair bit today, but I'm talking about one issue and one issue that's very contemporary, an issue that will be a brilliant debate and discussion topic for you to talk about in class. It relates to human rights and it's the question of free speech. And it's been in the news for a couple of reasons, and I'm going to go through them very quickly today. I'm not going to look at one article in great detail or anything like that. I'm going to jump between a whole bunch of articles. And if you need to pause and look at the, the, HT, the HTML of, of whatever it is, or the date, etc., feel free to do so. The first one is an opinion article it's by Jacqueline Maley. She's the senior journalist and columnist at City Morning Herald. And this is 12th of July, 2020. Salman Rushdie survived an actual fatwa. Yet he still thinks the Twitter crowd has gone too far. Talks all about Salman Rushdie, who he was. A fatwa, fatwa was declared on him. It's kind of like a holy war concept. Uh, the, his, his 1988 novel, The Satanic Verses, was blasphemous towards Islam, or was considered to be, and a bounty was put on his head by the Ayatollah of Iran. He has basically had to go into hiding for, for a decade there, given police protection, a whole bunch of other stuff happened. You can still earn yourself $3 million to kill him if, you, if you'd like. Uh, of all the names that have signed it, this, this letter that we hear about, this open letter published this week in Harper's Magazine, warning against a growing illiberalism of debate, Rushdie's was the most interesting. Other high-profile signatories include Noam Chomsky, very left-wing leaning professor, Margaret Atwood, she's an author. She she wrote uh, a feminist novel, uh, The Power. Uh, John Benville, not sure who he is. Uh, J.K. Rowling, everyone knows, the author of, of Harry Potter and Gloria Steinem, a feminist icon. So some very interesting names there. The letter expressed anxiety that the free exchange of information and ideas, the lifeblood of liberal society, is daily becoming more constricted. And while we have come to expect this from the radical right, Censoriousness, so so stopping people from having their say, is also speaking more widely in our culture. This is expressed through an intolerance of opposing views, a vogue for public shaming and ostracism, and the tendency to dissolve complex policy issues in a blinding moral certainty. In other words, they're talking about cancel culture here. Some people made the valid point that one person's cancel culture is another person's critique, that the vigorous criticism, including ridicule of a person's ideas or art, does not amount to a crushing of free speech. That freedom of speech is truly threatened when states silence dissent with force, not when people's feelings get hurt on the internet. Look at Hong Kong right now, not Sydney or New York or the boundless plains of Twitter, if you want to see the real threats to free speech look like. Which brings us back to Rushdie. He's experienced state censorship and death threats. He risked his life for his artistic freedom. Yet he still thinks social media enabled phenomenon of public shavings and shamings and cancellations is pernicious and suffocating to artists like himself. And that its consequences will result in risk aversion amongst artists, which equals the death of any real creative questing. So here's this, this question. It's talking all about this letter. And basically saying cancel culture is really not helpful at all. So she kind of finishes up here. Uh, do we want to foster a society where it's only possible to be artistically or intellectually brave if you have wealth or privilege to fall back on? And so this perverse obsession with calling out problematic individuals reaches its end point. A schoolyard game where the popular kids make the playground such a nasty place to play, the more sensitive kids pack up and go home. Others are turned off by the silliness of it all. Still more fail to engage in the first place because they see there that nothing appeals to them. That's Jacqueline Maley. What's going on with this letter? We can jump over here to this letter. This is it. There's his Harper's Magazine. A letter on justice and open debate. 7th of July, so five days previous to Jacqueline Maley's article. Our cultural institutions are facing a moment of trial. Powerful protests for racial and social justice are leading to overdue demands for police reform, along with wider calls for greater equality and inclusion across our society, not least in higher education, journalism, philanthropy, and the arts. So this is talking about Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is happening. But this needed reckoning has also intensified a new set of moral attitudes and political commitments that tend to weaken our norms of open debate and toleration of differences in favor of ideological conformity. So this is not 
cancel culture being said, but it's very much talking about cancel culture. As we applaud the first development, we also raise our voices against the second. The forces of illiberalism are gaining strength throughout the world and have a powerful ally in Donald Trump, who represents a real threat to democracy. But resistance must not be allowed to harden into its own brand of dogma or coercion, which right-wing demagogues are already exploiting. The democratic inclusion we want can be achieved only if we speak out against the intolerant climate that has set in on all sides. So this is a this is a letter in which we are we are basically seeing them saying we cannot we cannot go up against the the right if you're a left leaning person by cancelling all right wing voices by cancelling anyone that speaks differently to you. That's not a free exchange of ideas. The lifeblood of liberal society, and they're saying because of that it's becoming more constricted. It goes on to talk a whole bunch of, of different things. This stifling atmosphere will ultimately harm the most vital causes of our time, the restriction of debate, whether a pr- repressive government or an intolerant society invariably hurts those who lack power and makes everyone less capable of democratic participation. The way to defeat bad ideas is by exposure, argument and persuasion, not by trying to silence it or w- wish them away. We refuse any false choice between justice and freedom, which cannot exist without each other. As writers, we need a culture that leaves us room for experimentation, risk-taking, and even mistakes. We need to preserve the possibility of good faith disagreement without dire professional consequences. If we won't defend the very thing on which our work depends, we shouldn't expect the public or the state to defend it for us. And there are all the different writers that are historians, uh, various college university professors from you know from Yale, uh, Illinois, New York Magazine, Writers and performers, MIT, Noam Chomsky there. So, so a, a long list of some very prestigious people putting their names to this letter. And J.K. Rowling, some very, very important people there claiming this letter needs to be heard. So what's happened because of this? A few things. Thumbs up, thumbs down. So this is... Uh, this is an example. So this is the day before Jacqueline Maley's article, Thumbs Up, Thumbs Down, The Cycles of Cancel Culture. There's a scene in Ridley Scott's 2000 film, Gladiator, where the emperor's son, Commodus, considers whether he will let General Maximus Decimus Meridius live or die. As Commodus wavers between lifting or dropping his thumb, the camera pans across the Colosseum, the crowd's on its feet chanting, live. With reluctance, the thumb is raised, Maximus is saved, the crowd roars as orchestral music Soars. Great introduction. Thank you very much, Melanie Kembry. July 11th. 11.20 p.m. Wow, go to bed, Melanie. Okay, what have, what's happening here? Uh, it's a scene that speaks to some of the strains of our contemporary climate. The sense of the masses directly influencing traditional institutions of authority, of cancellation, being in the mere flick of a wrist, and of the ethics of seeing choices about a life and livelihood served up for mass consumption. Two separate, but in many ways similar statements signed by some of Australia's and the world's most significant cultural leaders published last week, she's talking about the letter in Harper's, have intensified the debate about these subjects, which are often lumped together under the catch-all phrase, cancel culture. While neither letter specifically mentions cancel culture, they share an interest in questions of free speech, censorship, and how and who chooses when the thumb turns up or down. Might stop it there. If we're looking at how this relates to the syllabus, wow, have a look, have a think about this. For example, issues of compliance and non-compliance in relation to human rights. So if free speech is a human right, who's complying and who's non-complying here? Is, is, are we having kind of cancel culture? Is cancel culture not complying with this concept of, of free speech by kind of ensuring like, you know, getting some campaigns to get people fired for their views, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Or are they actually upholding free speech by speaking themselves? The development of human rights as a reflection of changing values and ethical standards. We'll talk about that one more in a second, but it's definitely there. The role of law reform in protecting human rights. So when we get this mob cancel culture ex, you know, experience happening, what role should law reform play? What's, what, what should the government have to say about this? And we'll talk about this in a second. And obviously, the effectiveness of legal and non-legal measures in protecting human rights. And we're talking about human rights here. We're talking about, if we're looking through the role, the role of the media in promoting and enforcing human rights, most certainly, and obviously state sovereignty, 
if you've got governments wanting to have to have their say. In Australia, most certainly, we're talking about uh, the media and non-government organisations. And this is a contemporary issue of limitations on free speech. So a whole bunch just there, and we haven't even looked at everything yet. We're going we're gonna to see just how prevalent this is. And we're going to have a look now at an example. This is an example of free speech. This is Eliza Scanlon on the set of Mukbang. In Australia, Cultural Heavyweight published a statement in response to the controversy surrounding debut director Eliza Scanlon's Sydney Film Festival prize-winning Mukbang, a short film about a schoolgirl binge eating food online as part of a trend that has been popular in South Korea for the past decade. Michelle Law, she is a, uh, an actor. Uh, I think she's uh, Benjamin Law's brother. She reflected on the white supremacist tendency in the Australian film industry following this film. Due to its exploration of Buck Bang and an now deleted scene that showed this drawing of this girl kind of violently attacking a schoolboy, kind of had a, had a hands around his, around his neck. In response, the 27 signatories in response to this attack on the film, including Indigenous filmmakers Warwick Thornton, Rachel Perkins, Ivan Sen and Darren Dale, writer Andrew Bovell and Hollywood star Joel Edgerton and his brother Nash, argued that something is dangerously askew in the way that we are talking about race in the arts in this country. We feel that it is time we spoke up. The current focus on public shaming and burning down the industry is misguided and ahistorical. Even if it started as an attempt at genuine critique, in the divisive and polarizing world of social media, it has quickly descended into online bullying. So here's an example. Here's an example of this cancel culture being seen in this film, which had some problematic elements, was a quite a risque film. Most certainly, it's a it's a journey of discovery about a, a young girl binge eating for others to to watch. It's certainly not a you know run of the mill Hollywood blockbuster type film, and it's been called out. And so this is an example where cancel, cancel culture has been attempted, and a whole bunch of of really big people in the film industry in Australia have stepped up and said, no, this is not happening. While acknowledging structural racism within the arts industry, author Christos Selkius, so he was uh, he wrote The Slap, said one of the key reasons he signed the letter was because he was alarmed by the ugliness of the rhetoric at the moment and the annihilation of an individual's dignity. Remember, this is all about free speech, so it's really quite interesting to hear these kind of terms being used. I feel sympathy with a lot of people on Twitter. I don't believe censoring and shaming is the way forward. I think it's been incredibly destructive historically. And my fear now is people get caught up in their bubbles and they must be sick of it. Everyone is throwing stones and no one is taking a moment to think. This concept, these bubbles, it's the idea that on Twitter, you follow the people that you agree with. And what we get is these echo chambers where you say, oh, this is terrible. And everyone pays out this one person. And that's, that's, that's how these ideas of these throwing stones get, get centered. Someone takes something out of context or sometimes in context and they throw it into their echo chamber and everyone just goes crazy at this person. How dare they? That's so racist, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's so sexist, that's misogynist, whatever the, the topic is. And they start throwing stones. One of the filmmakers involved in writing the statement who asked not to be named, notes that, asked not to be named, described the Sydney Film Festival as a beloved institution and said a video call involving industry leaders was held as the debate about mukbang unfolded online. There was a shared sentiment, the filmmaker said, that figures who should be allies in the campaign for greater diversity were eating each other in a very public way. The question of whether to include white arts leaders as signatories was a topic of considerable discussion, but the group came to the conclusion that this is an issue for our whole industry and white people have to be a part of that discussion. Fascinating. There was a lot of talk about trying to not to make it inflammatory, to keep it cool-headed, the filmmaker said. We didn't want to inflame things further, but of course, that's not what happened. On the same day that that Sydney Morning Herald uh, broke that news about the 153 prominent writers writing that letter for Harper's Magazine, this was also put out. So both letters copped swift and severe criticism for being paternalistic, out of touch, overblown, hypocritical, and complicit with structures of racism. The signatories, it was pointed out, were well-resourced figures of cultural authority who had easy access to major news outlets and no real risk of being 
cancelled. Arab Australian poet Omar Sark said, sorry if I've said your name wrong there, Omar, said it never surprised him when people with a great deal of access can't see the problem or think things are going swell. It felt wrong to me that a collection of older, for the most part, established figures in the arts world would, under the banner of the City Morning Herald to an audience of millions, publicly try to shut down an argument put forward by one or a small group of people on Twitter of all places. While the media indulged in the fantasy of free speech debate, Sark said, said other key voices and issues were denied. This included discussions about the need for greater diversity in media, including at The Age and Sydney Morning Herald, which has been criticised for appointing five freelance cultural critics, all of whom were white, two of whom resumed, uh, resigned in protest over the lack of cultural diversity among the five critics. Michelle Law was among those who were critical of those appointments. It goes on, it goes on. This is a helpful article for you to look at. And this is Muck Bang once again. The director apologised after the Sydney, Sydney Film Festival racism outcry. This is by Gary Maddox on June 21st. So actress and director Eliza Scanlon has deleted a scene where, the, where it shows the, the drawing. So it's not actually a person attacking anyone. It shows the drawing. I'll show you in a second. So that's, that's her. The jury uh, of actor-producer Brian Brown and directors George Miller and Sophie Hyde uh, described Scanlon as a director with a fresh voice at the virtual festival's ceremony. So here's Eliza. I intended this film to be a young girl's journey of self-discovery in the age of internet culture, and I failed to recognise how problematic this was. There's the, there's the picture. Michelle Law, I have seen it beyond being profoundly problematic in the way it appropriates Korean culture in order for a white girl to find herself with the equivalent of Eat, Pray, Love for teenagers. It contains the following scene. Again, content warning. So, so this is Michelle Law. And a senior lecturer in directing the Australian film television radio school, Pearl Tan, said she and her friends have been privately sharing anger, sadness and disappointment since watching Mukbang. She was deeply disappointed with the festival and the judges for it being selected and winning without anyone questioning the lack of cultural competency. Once the issue was flagged, the film festival swiftly conspired with the filmmakers to re-edit the film and slide that new edit quietly into the streaming platform, she wrote on Facebook. So, so it's one with the problematic elements, then they've re-edited it to take them out and then very quietly put that in there. So that, to me, that sounds very, very, a little dodgy and other people agreed most certainly. And, and there's a good example of, of what can happen at the coal, at the coal face of, of the arts. Now, Continuing with the arts. No, actually, we'll go to this one first. In Bed with Gnomes. This is Tom Switzer. This is a, a right-wing guy. He's, the, he's a columnist. He is a director of something. Uh, director of the Center for Independent Studies. So it's, a, it's kind of a, a conservative think tank. In Bed with Gnome. The fight to say what you think madness. Uh, sorry. The fight to say what you think makes strange bedfellows. So Tom Switzer, very, very different. He's on the right wing. Noam Chomsky's on the left. That's what he means by in bed with Noam. You know, we live in a strange world where people like me are forced to draw comfort from the statements of Noam Chomsky and Bernie Sanders supporter Zephyr Teachout. The left-wing radicals are among 150 esteemed artists. He's talking about the, the letter there. He quotes the letter. Uh, they go on to burn an intolerance of opposing views. The letter follows former President Barack Obama's denunciations of woke culture and purity tests. Of course, Obama and the Harper's letter writers are right. Remember, this is, uh, this is the opinion of Tom. It is abominable that effectively a bunch of blinkered self-righteous activists are dictating to the rest of us how we should feel about certain issues. Blacklisting people because of what they sincerely feel and believe and terrifying people into confessing their unorthodox thoughts in the hope they might achieve some sort of redemption is not how liberal democracies are supposed to work. And then we see this, uh, this list of all these people that have, had, that have come up against cancel culture. Just look at the relentless campaign of ideological conformity that swept the Western world. And no, I'm not referring to the mob's toppling statues of historical figures. A University of Chicago economist recently lost his contract with the Chicago Federal Reserve after he criticised the Black Lives Movement. The offending tweet, BLML, BLM, just torpedoed itself with its full-fledged support of defund the police. A Boeing executive was forced to resign over an article he wrote more than three decades ago opposing women in military combat. Actress Halle Berry pulled out of playing a transgender character after an online backlash following an interview that the Thought Police deemed unacceptable. A scheduled event starring former Trump advisor Steve Bannon with the New Yorker magazine was cancelled after a Twitter mob backlash. 
And he goes on to talk about it. All of this, a matter of grave concern that goes to the heart of liberal society. Protecting freedom of speech is a serious challenge that faces genuine free thinkers in coming years. It is terrifying that those living in free societies would have to say just such a thing. He then goes on to talk about J.K. Rowling, author of the Harry Potter series, because of her views on transgender issues. In response, a few signatories have distanced themselves from the letter and pleaded for forgiveness for initially supporting the initiative. So how's that? They've put their name to the letter. Then J.K. Rowling has put her name to the letter, and because they disagree with her view on transgenderism, they have distanced themselves from the letter. A little ironic if you think if you think about it. But although they have every right to disagree with Rowling, isn't the point here that different views should be tolerated? I've been denounced in these pages and elsewhere for holding unfashionable views. He goes all about those, etc., etc. The cancel culture defenders say attitudes have changed and that marginalised groups are starting to gain equal footing in society. Why then are they so afraid of a debate? The exclusion of views that challenge the consensus can only hurt the activists for the reason John Stuart Mill elaborated in his famous 1859 essay on liberty. He who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. Why not, as the Harper's Letter writers put it, try to defeat bad ideas by exposure, argument, and persuasion, not by trying to silence or wish them away? What activists who run the cancel culture don't understand is that you can disagree with them without wishing to obliterate them, though they seem to wish to obliterate their opponents. This mindset is like a disease paralyzing the intellect and one for which we have yet to find an antidote. Genuine liberals from whatever political or philosophical creed have to expose not just the activists' ignorance and their unreasonableness, but their immense dangerousness. It is not just that they invite an extremist response from their opponents. Think Trump on steroids. It is that if too many people roll over in front of them, we shall damage liberal democracy irreparably. So there we go. That's a, that's a, the point of Tim, Tom Switzer talking about that as well. Here's an idea. Just watch this the other day. Jim Jeffries slams millennials and cancel culture in his new Netflix special. Talking about the arts and pushing the envelope. Really, this is something that, that comics have had a huge problem with. And, and this article briefly touches on it. It's, uh, it's from ScreenRant.com five days ago by QV Hoff. On the surface, the title of Jim Jeffries' Netflix special seems to align with other comedians who use show titles to address Criticism, so intolerance, the name of his. For example, the streaming service released Joe, Joe Rogan's Triggered in 2016 and Bill Burr's Walk Your Way Out in 2017. The list goes on and on. In 2019, Aziz Ansari apologised for his behaviour, past behaviour, in Right Now. And Dave Ch uh, Chappelle took an unapologetic approach with Sticks and Stones. In 2020, Chris D'Elia and Mark Maron have similarly addressed backlash, blah, 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 blah. Over the years, Jeffries has been consistent with his on-stage demeanour and intolerance is full of profanity-laced, it really is, commentaries, with the title itself being a double-edged sword that references both cancel culture and jokes about him being lactose intolerant. This was, uh, he goes on about, it's a thing about same-sex marriage there with his father, but this is the bit that I thought was very interesting. In the second half of Intolerant, Jeffries addresses cancel culture and how comedians are suddenly public enemy number one. Overall, he hits the main talking points that comedians usually cover when defending their material, but does add something new to the conversation with the sharp societal observation. Jeffries points out that he's now being criticised for jokes that were made 10 years ago, but reminds the audience that there was a clear line that he and his peers tried not to cross. Our job is to go right up to the line, Jeffries says, and compares the craft of stand-up comedy to gambling. So basically he says, you know... Sometimes a joke doesn't work. Sometimes you try something and it doesn't work. And you wouldn't talk to a pilot who's just crashed a plane and say, why did you decide to crash the plane? He didn't mean to. It just didn't work. And he says all the time, is the, that's the point of comedy. You go up there and you kind of you get right up to the line. The problem is, he says, is that's where the line was 10 years ago. And he's been criticized for what he said 10 years ago when the line has actually moved in those 10 years. So how far back do we go in society and start criticizing people and trying to cancel them for views that are no longer socially acceptable, but were at the time? Note this happening with, uh, with politicians and blackface, with comedians and blackface. So, so what they thought was appropriate at the time to make a joke is now seen, I think correctly, 
as incredibly inappropriate and they've been pulled up on it. Now, that, that might be absolutely fine, but it does beg the question, are comedians being held to account and, and how are they going to push the envelope as comedians but also worry about in the future what they're saying being taken based on the context of the future line and what does that do to free speech? As you can see, it's a fascinating topic to think about. Really, really interesting. And the final point I make, because I've been going on and on and on, is this question of our Charter of Rights. So this is from August last year, August 13th, 2019. Why an Australian Charter of Rights is a matter of national urgency. It's by Gillian Triggs, Emeritus Professor of University of Melbourne and former Australian Human Rights Commissioner. Very, very good person to quote. What does she say? If anyone doubts the need for a Charter of Rights in Australia, the uh, the Bener uh, the sorry Benerji decision of the High Court handed down last week demonstrates why legislative protection of common law freedoms have become a matter of national urgency. We have it from the most authoritative source. The High Court has confirmed unanimously that Australians do not have a personal right to freedom of speech. Most Australians might be surprised to learn this, but this is one of the consequences of Australia being the only Western democracy without some form of Charter of Rights legislated by a parliament or entrenched in the Constitution. The High Court is technically right. The Constitution does not explicitly protect the right to freedom of speech. In its ruling, court upheld the government's right to sack Michaela Banerji, a public servant, for her critical tweets about the indefinite detention of refugees offshore. It was highly technical and narrow interpretation of the law. It failed to acknowledge the common law right to freedom of expression, which is as ancient as the English Bill of Rights of 1689. It also failed to recognize Australia's international treaty of obligations, et cetera, et cetera. She talks about it. Timing, of course, is everything. The decision comes in the middle of a national debate about the need for religious freedom protections and Israel Folau case, freedom of speech, and the threats to press freedom by recent federal police raids on News Corp journalists and the ABC. It is more than ironic the government should also be prosecuting Bernard Collery, a former Attorney General for the ACT. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Go back. His alleged offence was to provide legal advice to Witness K, a whistleblower who recently agreed to plead guilty to releasing information about Australia's spying activities on Timor Leste, etc., etc., etc. So this is an article saying, The big problem with our freedom of speech is that we don't have a Bill of Rights. We don't have a Charter of Rights. And that means we now have a serious deficit in legal protection for human rights in Australia. Rights that have been in regression for 20 years. We need to consider a legislated charter setting out the rights we care about. And I'll leave it there. A fascinating topic that I'm sure many, many legal studies classes will listen to this and go, yeah, let's have a big debate about this in class. It's also brilliant for covering so much of the human rights topic and crime as well. If people are being held accountable by by the government for their tweets and so much more. So fascinating. Please get onto it. Ask your teacher. Let's have a debate about it.